Hello again, I am Blunty. In my last video, if you haven't seen it, or if you skipped it, or if YouTube's algorithm never even told you it friggin' existed, I reviewed the Gigabyte GeForce RTX 3070 Eagle 8G, the lowest priced triple fan 3070 you can buy. And you should buy it, by the way, in case you did skip that video, it's really nice. But this video will be about how remarkable an overclocker it is. And spoiler alert, when I say remarkable, what I mean is I got it tanked up far enough to put me in the top 7% of performance results in 3D Mark's leaderboards for the 3070. Top 7%. Budget price card. Haha. <laughs> But that was with a manual overclock. So firstly, let's have a look at this. This card, like its entire family, regardless of branding, has the ability to go through an automatic process of testing to determine a power and speed curve specific to that exact card. The process is one click. It might look slightly differently to this, depending on the manufacturer's own software interface for it, but it is entirely safe and will lock in a nice boost for your performance versus out of the box. Think of it like a fine tuning process for your particular card. So if you're nervous about overclocking, just do this and you will get some free speed really quickly and you don't even have to know what you're doing. But if you are a little braver or just more experienced or want to learn, you can of course go full manual overclock. I won't run through the process here. There's a ton of guides out there. So it won't be hard for you to start learning how to do it if you have no idea. But if you are new, you can feel confident in the fact that you really can't break anything. All the software for doing it these days is quite safe. It has hard limits built in to stop you from legit burning out your hardware. Worst possible case scenario, you go too far and the graphics driver crashes. In which case it'll either automatically restart for you or you just reboot your machine. With that said, I plopped up the power and temperature limits to the maximum safe allowed and started fiddling with core clocks. And once I got that locked in, I started fiddling with memory clocks. And from a starting point of out of the box clock of 1725 megahertz, which is already a big step up from the 1500 megahertz, which is the standard stock on the founder's edition card, I pushed this up to 2070 megahertz without sacrificing having to worry about temperatures or stability. And I know for a fact I could have gone further if I was just interested in trying to set a record or something, but I wanted an overclock I could actually use in gaming without worrying about it crashing, rather than getting lucky to get all the way through a benchmark just to set a big number. So like I said, stock clocks for the Founders card are 1.5 gigahertz, and I just popped right past 2 gigahertz without even trying very hard. That's a lot more than I thought I'd get too. Remember, this is the budget priced model from Gigabyte. This isn't even one of their fancy ones. It's not even the OC model of the Eagle card, which is a slightly better binned one that comes with a higher overclock out of the box, but otherwise identical. This little bugger is just a base model, one of the cheapest 37s you can buy. And like I said in my review, the heatsink felt remarkably light by today's standards, so I was a bit worried about keeping temperatures under control under an overclock. But here we are. I also pushed the memory just past 2000 over the stock 1750. The specific numbers don't matter so much as all cards, even the exact same models, will do just a little bit differently to one another thanks to component variations and the silicon lottery as we like to call it. So best to dial in your own numbers and know what you're doing rather than trying to copy paste someone else's like mine because it might not work for you, you might do worse, you might do better. Now, rather more importantly than math is the real difference this makes in games and how they run. So in Watch Dogs Legion at 1440p maxed out settings and high ray tracing settings, the max jumps up an extra 10 FPS, which is very, very nice, but we were already over 60, which is enough for this game. And in normal gameplay, I would in fact lock it at 60. The big difference here though, is cleaning up the lag spikes on the minimums, going from 10 FPS at stock clocks to 38 FPS minimums on the overclock. Huge difference and much, 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 much smoother gameplay. Hooray! And it took the overall average to above 60 FPS instead of just below. At 4K, we see a similar lift in the lows, but for some reason a dip in the highs. Never did figure that one out. But again, well above 60, which is where I like this game locked anyway. Horizon Zero Dawn sees the pattern continue. A moderate lift in maximum frame rates, but an extremely welcome boost to lift the minimums out of the problematic territory of under 30 FPS to an extremely playable 42 at the lowest. And if you haven't picked up on it yet, that really is one of the biggest benefits of overclocking. It's not about pushing your high-end FPS up higher, it's about eliminating the problematic lows so you get smoother gameplay all over. So. Same again at 4K, though the lows here are still a concern, but in reality, in actual gameplay, it's very rare to see it dive down to what you're seeing in the benchmark here. 
So that boost to consistency and frame rate is still extremely welcome and means less compromises at 4K to nail it down to 60 if we wanted to. And much like in my video comparing the RX 6800 to this card, at stock, GTA 5 shows there's bottlenecks elsewhere, so the overclock doesn't make much of an impact, really, aside from a slight overall lift in FPS at 1440p and at 4K both. Godfall at 1440p sees a tidy uplift in average FPS on average between 5 and 10 advantage for the overclock. Unfortunately, I hit some sort of bug at 4K when I tried to repeat the test, which tanked the benchmark. Burned an hour trying to figure out that one before I rage quit. I've had a lot of annoying issues with Godfall as a benchmark. A lot of really annoying issues. I can only hope future patches iron out its petulance, because it is a useful game to use as a benchmark, because, well, look at it. The point is, these and a few other tests I ran proved that the overclock was stable, noticeable, and the card still stayed quiet and cool. I soaked into Watch Dogs Legion for six hours straight with the maximum overclock in place, and it was entirely well behaved the whole time, apart from Watch Dogs Legion's own propensity for occasionally crashing, but that happens whether or not I had the overclock. The temperatures did peak higher overall, particularly in benchmarking, but still no more than 85 degrees at the absolute top end, and even that was only a short spike. And that is a long way below anything that's even an issue for the hardware as far as throttling is concerned. I do expect someone with greater skill and greater patience than I could squeeze out even a bit more from this card to perhaps get it stable enough to run through a benchmark to set a higher record. But again, I like things practical. I like things to work in gaming. So I like to keep the fans quiet, even with an overclock, and I'm very happy at this point. But for the sake of argument and to pay off the tease at the beginning of the video, in artificial benchmarks, the clinical difference becomes stark. TimeSpy jumps up enough to place me in the top 40 results for the 3070 series, which again, really rather unexpected for a budget card. And in the ray tracing benchmark, Port Royal, Port Royal, Port Royal, how are you pronouncing it? Well, however you say it, I have plumped easily into the top 7% of results. That kind of blew me away. Just when I start comparing it on the leaderboards, I'm matching the clocks and memory speeds of what are surely noticeably more expensive models, and a lot of the scores that beat me have come across the line with the benefit of an overclocked CPU helping them out as well, whereas I was just running stock clocks on my 3900X. So again, with a bit more time and a bit more tweaking and overclocking my CPU, I could probably climb even higher on these charts if I wanted to. So, on the one hand, the suspicious and cynical might accuse Gigabyte of hand-picking a golden sample card for their friendly YouTuber types like me, or maybe I just got lucky on the Silicon Lottery. Either way, what it does is demonstrates very easily that this card, its power management, its power management hardware, and its cooler are all very capable of coping with a pretty decent and still quiet and perfectly stable overclock. And that's the important takeaway message here. If you do want to overclock your card and you're worried about going at the budget level and you're worried about the sort of relatively lightweight, comparatively lightweight cooler on this thing, don't. It keeps up easily. And again, for, I don't know, the fifth time in this video, it stays quiet while it does it, which is so important for me. So all of that only feeds the confidence with which I can now recommend this card to budget-conscious 3070 seekers again. So thank you very much for watching. Hope you have found this interesting, informative, or useful. Preferably all of the above. And of course, the usual amounts of praise and appreciation and, and big, round, fluffy, lovey feelings for the patrons whose above and beyond support is really, really appreciated. To the rest of you, I hope you did the thumb and the comment and the bell and stuff, because that's how you can help out. And I appreciate that too. If you haven't done anything, well, um, I hope you enjoyed the video at least. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and I will catch you next time.